All right, team. It's a twofer today. That's right. I won't stay out of your hair, but I've got a good friend of mine uh, joining us today, Ricky Silber, here to talk about why he likes to accept VA offers, and you should too. Ricky, what's up, brother? Yo, what up? What's going on, my man? I'm playing with some graphics here. Let me see if I can make us look cool. I um, like it. I, I need extra help to look cool. <laughs> well, hey, check this out, man. This is one of those like markets that, I mean, have, first of all, have you ever seen a market like this? You do a lot of listings, I know. Um, just from, from a listing agent standpoint, is this the strongest seller's market you've ever seen? By far. There's no question. It's not even close, honestly. And we've been, we've been in a seller's market for quite some time, but not quite like this. Yeah, this is the strongest I've seen it from a seller side, pretty much to the point where if you're a buyer, you have to waive the appraisal and agree to pay a certain amount of the difference at, at a minimum um, to really receive any any chance in about 95% of the deals. Is that what you're seeing too? Yeah, for sure. And you know, I'm also seeing a lot of the buyer's agents complaining like in the Facebook groups and stuff, but I don't think anybody really understands. It's stressful for everybody. It's stressful for the listing agent. You don't know if these deals are gonna stay together. People make, massive promises to get a contract accepted and then they look for loopholes and ways to get in and out of things when things don't go their way so it's it's stressful all around i don't think anybody really likes this market except the seller <laughs> sellers like this market that's for sure buyers are having a hard time uh, yeah it's tough it's tough and i want to ask you some questions on that front just like if you're a buyer um and you know what that kind of looks like um, to, to help. But the, tell me this, you know, because I think there's a lot of, I work mostly with VA buyers, um, you know, and there's a lot of people who are hesitant. A lot of listing agents are hesitant to accept, um, you know, a VA offer. So if, if that's the case, um, you know, and a lot of them are worried about the appraisal specifically, um, not just, you know, appraisal bridge and being able to cover a difference if it doesn't come into value, but just the appraisal in general. A lot of people believe, in fact, the listing agent I talked to this morning said, this is a VA offer, you know, VA appraisals come in low. Just what she said, you know, it's just uh, this, hey, just you don't, you know. And so a lot of people believe that. So what is your thoughts on that as a listing agent, as far as, you know, when you see a VA offer versus other offers and how you consider one versus the other? I know that you saw my post and that's what sparked this conversation between us, but I, on the listing side, I like to take VA offers and I know that's not, that's not uh, the overwhelming majority thought. Um, but I, I prefer to take a VA offer when one's available for a couple of reasons. Um, like what you're saying, the biggest thing for me is first of all, VA appraisals don't come in lower across the board than other types of appraisals. That's poppycock. Um, but it has the Tidewater initiative and how can you complain about that? Look, I've had to do it a couple times this year. I'm always successful doing it. The reality is that on a conventional appraisal, you're just as likely to come in low and a conventional appraiser has no incentive to take any extra outside information from you. And in fact, you can dispute the value. You can submit data, but they can just basically tell you to shove off at the end of the at the end of the conversation. VA has a built-in appraisal dispute process before the appraisal is even finalized. If a VA appraiser is having an issue getting to the value of the contract, they will initiate Tidewater and give you an opportunity to submit information that you're looking at um, that maybe they haven't seen. And so, in your experience. That's not an act in futility. I know a lot of people have told me, listing agents recently have said, yeah, yeah, Tidewater, Tidewater, Schmidewater. Um, you know, it doesn't work. Nothing changes. Um, you know, if you, if you submit stuff to the appraiser, they won't necessarily give you anything for that. Um, I think it's great that the process exists for VA because at least it gives you a shot. Um, and at least you know, you get a little bit of a, a warning that, hey, something might be coming. But what about success rates with this, Ricky? I'm batting 100%. 100%. In, in not, not always in getting to the contract price, but in getting values up. So like, here's a perfect example of why this is a good process to go through. My most recent Tidewater was on a townhome um, in a newer development in South Bay. And 
the appraisal was coming in low. He asked for information. So here's the reality. The appraiser was only looking in the townhome category. But I know that a lot of real estate agents suck and will miss file stuff. So when I looked in the all other attached category, there was several comps that justified the value. And I brought those to his attention. I filled out the VA grid, got it over to them. 24 hours later, appraisal came in at contract price. And he didn't, the biggest problem was he didn't assume people were doing stuff wrong. And I know that people do stuff wrong all the time. And there was not just one, not just two, there was four mislabeled townhomes in the all other attached category. What are they mislabeled to? All other attached. So the, okay. the agents classified them as condos when they were actually townhomes. Not a lot of people know what the definition of a townhome is. So they're like, oh, well, it's not a detached house. Let's put it in attached. And that was the wrong classification. And the appraiser didn't look outside of what the property actually was. That's good information. That's really good information to have, especially in that type of situation. That You said it was a new build? It was a newer build. It was built in 2018. Okay. That's good. The other secret sauce with that is calling your title company and asking for closings that occurred off MLS because it does happen. It's not prevalent, but sometimes when you're digging for a needle in a haystack, it's absolutely worth contacting the title company and saying, hey, is there anything in this radius uh, that closed off market? Nice. Well, yes, please don't see that in MLS. I think it's just a great effort to make, you know, to hold the deal together because this is the market, the kind of market where once we're in contract, nobody wants nobody wants to go back on the market. It's so much work um, to to be on the market right here. Listing agents really earning their money too. A lot of people, you know, kind of take that for granted on the buy side that they, you know they've got a lot to sift through. Um, and it's very there's a lot of pressure when you get thirty offers to pick one that's going to actually come to fruition. You know, you pick one that doesn't. That's kind of egg on your face, big time. Um, so I think that you know just having having the the understanding. You know, what I really want to achieve here is to create the understanding of the reality of the situation. You know, accepting a VA offer doesn't mean that you're just accepting a low appraised value and doesn't mean that you have to give in to a Tidewater situation. I mean, if a Tidewater situ situation represents, now you said you're 100% and getting the value up on Tidewater. What is it that you're doing when you receive the Tidewater in order? I mean, you're just sending comps over. Is there more to it? What's the strategy there? It's mostly just identifying things from a different perspective than the appraiser might be looking at it. Um, we are basically just sending comps, but we're finding comps that maybe they're not seeing. So like I said, we're finding stuff that traded off market. Um, we're finding stuff that's miscategorized. We are oftentimes finding things and justifying why something might be a better comp or a closer comp or a comp that might deserve more weighting than maybe what they're looking at. Here's the biggest problem right now is that appraisers are backed up. So what I'm seeing a lot of is we're getting appraisers from out of area, right? So you have people coming in from Temecula or elsewhere in Riverside County to do appraisals, and they're not necessarily familiar with the neighborhood layout. So like, here's a perfect example. Uh, we had a listing in Kensington. The appraiser picked all comps from Normal Heights not really understanding where the boundaries were drawn between these two areas because they're both in 92116. So they're drawing a half mile radius around the property and they're pulling everything that recently traded. But anybody who's familiar with the area knows that once you get east of the 15 and you're actually in Kensington proper, property values are not comparable. Wow. So are, so you, are you taking the time in a situation like that to actually like go, okay, Mr. Praiser, I know your you know business card says um, you know, Temecula. So let me explain to you what these two areas are and why they're so different. I mean, do you go and have a conversation or what is your method for communicating something that important? It's all in writing. I mean, you're not really having conversations with the appraiser. You're, you have an opportunity to speak with the appraiser when you're on site with them at the appraisal. But at that point in the, in the process, you're not necessarily aware of whether or not they're having difficulty with anything. You know, you're just there, you're polite, you offer up any information that they desire, let them know how the activity was while it was on market, how many offers you may have gotten. It's not until later that you realize that maybe they didn't see it. Sometimes, once in a while, an appraiser will come in and he's already done some homework 
and and says, you know, look, I'm I'm having a little bit of a hard time with this one. You know, what are you seeing that maybe I'm not seeing? And that's a great opportunity to be face to face with an appraiser and go over things. But other than that, I mean, you can you can articulate all these points very well in writing. So and, and that's probably a good idea too to keep everything in writing. So there's a nice paper trail um, of the dissemination of said information. Um, what I did want to ask you too, from like, from the buy side perspective here, cause I'm, I'm mostly working buy sides and you're mostly working sell sides. Um, you know, so, okay. So for you, which is your rare listing agent, who's going to advise to sellers that, Hey, this VA offer isn't anything to be scared of. Um, but what are some of the other things as well that are going to be important right now? that buyers can do to try to stand out or to not get in the rejection pile. I feel like right now listing agents are looking at offers like opening the mail and most of them are going into the junk pile. That's just going to get thrown away without even getting opened. And then there's like, there's a few, there's half a dozen maybe that are going over here to the good pile. And we're going to look at all those. Is that, is that how it's going down or, or what, what can we do to get in that, the good open pile? I mean, the reality of it is when you're getting 30 offers on a listing, you're not going to counter everybody because it's not necessary and it's too much work. And so you're really trying to identify the the top of the pile, like you say. And and to be fair, I mean, the structure of the offer is important, right? We, we want to have a reason to move forward with somebody through the process. But honestly, more importantly than that is the relationship from the buyer's agent to the listing agent, because I can't tell you how many times we just we get offers with no communication from the other side. So we don't, it's a, there's a lot of questions when you get something like that. You're trying to disseminate a lot from just reading the paper. Um, it's very different when an agent calls and articulates why they wrote the offer that they wrote, what the capabilities of are the buyer, what the expectations of are the buyer and, and getting a sense from that agent that they're going to get to the finish line. So you're, you know, you, you want to work with somebody who knows what they're doing, who knows what they're talking about, who knows how to navigate some of the challenges of a complicated market like we're in now. And, and very often the offers that aren't always the highest will be the ones that, you know, you, you recommend more to your client because you, you're, it's, you get offers that are crazy, you know, will never get there, right? They're just trying to do what you're saying and get to the top of the pile. It's very it's an art form to sift through 30 offers and determine, okay, here's the highest stuff. And then here's the stuff I have the most confidence in. Yeah. And that, so that was going to be a big part of my next question too, was, you know, when you, when you're looking at those offers and you're seeing people who are writing crazy, you know, values and things like that, the goal is still just to find the, the, the most likely offer to go through that has the, the most reasonable terms, right? I mean, um, just throwing out a big number is not necessarily going to get you there. Um, and there is a lot of work that has to be done on the listing side, even to make five or six different counter offers. Um, so from, f so for me selfishly from a, you know, VA buyer standpoint, what I know you're not afraid of VA, but you know, let's say I'm up against conventional 20% down, 25% down, you know, something like that's going on. What am I doing? Is it a higher earnest money? Is it appraisal bridge? What is it that's getting me into that pile? This thing at this point that's making that's making stuff stand out. So like here's a perfect example. You know, a lot of agents are writing offers and they're going for that shock and awe um, number, right? So if you've got two offers and one of them is fifty thousand dollars over list and they're offering to cover the appraisal gap by five thousand dollars and then you've got another offer that's thirty thousand dollars over list and the buyer is willing to cover the appraisal gap by twenty thousand dollars which of those offers is better are you asking me yes <laughs> yeah. you tell me i'm asking you i want you to tell me which one of those offers is better so the seller is going to see the higher preliminary number and be impressed by that. But what the detail that gets overlooked is the amount of the appraisal gap. So you know an appraisal is going to happen either way, right? So would you rather have a guarantee of 5,000 over or a guarantee of 20,000 over? The the When you're talking about written appraisal gaps in contracts, the, the purchase price dollar amount becomes irrelevant and it becomes a matter of how much the appraisal gap is. Gotcha. So, because you've got to assume that these appraisers, you know, 
one appraiser is going to be the same as another appraiser, right? In theory. So the appraisal gap number becomes more important than the purchase price number. Okay. So that's, that's what it's pretty much boiling down to then right now. And confidence in the lender and confidence in the agent. And I'm going to ask you about the lender in a second for my own selfish reasons. For now, let's pull up a question here. This one is from Wes Brown. He says that most listing agents don't want to speak over the phone and actually specify that in their confidential agent remarks. Uh, is that true, Ricky? I think most listing agents don't want to talk about showing instructions, but when it comes down to getting the offer written, I certainly want to talk to the buyer's agent. And, you know, what about the lender? You know, so for school me here for a second, because my, my method is pretty simple. Um, I like to do a text and email and a phone call, but all at different times, not all at once. You know, I send the email with the offer. Hey, I'm the lender. If you have questions, I'm here. Um, and then I'll follow up later, you know, with a text and then I'll follow up later if necessary, if we're in the mix and it's getting down to it with a call. Um, is that too much or what, what should a lender do to help, you know, make this, uh, make sense so that everyone knows that they're committed, they're involved, the buyers are, are in it to win it and they've got a good, you know, financing position. What's the best way for me as a lender to communicate that to the listing side? It's not too much. I think you, I think you need to be aggressive because the reality is that the more aggressive you are, the more you stand out. Here's what I'm seeing with lenders. Lenders are inundated with refis, right? So everybody's super busy. Um, you're not getting a lot of communication from lenders. So the lender that keeps at it and keeps offering information about the client and to you know stress to you how qualified they are, that stands out. Because you're, you know, you are getting a lot of calls from agents. You're getting a lot of emails and texts from agents. Very few from lenders, for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. Not even, you know, uh, a reply to the email that they're cc'd in necessarily, which is understandable. Everybody's busy, but when someone does reply, it sticks out. Okay, well, that's good information to have. I've thought that you know, you don't want to be too overbearing with people who you know are really inundated, especially with if an agent has three or four or five listings at a time right now, um, you know, what their day looks like, I can't imagine. Uh, but it's just got to be complete pile of coat hangers trying to figure out, you know, with all these offers coming in on all these different properties and who's where and at what stage it's all at. So I like to try to just stay in front, stay top of mind, let them know we're really interested. We're, we're really, you know, interested in this. We want to make this come through. We're not just throwing offers out all over the place. Um, and I think, you know, it has worked well for us so far, but any, any other nuggets for like buyers or for lenders like myself that like do's or don'ts, maybe, maybe some don'ts like, Hey, don't ever do this. It's really off putting. Uh, I mean, you know, everybody's different. I don't really like escalation clauses. Uh, I tend to counter those out. And I, I also think it puts you at a disadvantage because if you write an offer on my listing with an escalation clause to a certain amount, I'm going to counter out the escalation clause and I'm just going to counter you back to the highest point in your escalation clause. Cause I know that's what your client's willing to pay. Um, that's a lot of, it's just, I don't know. It's that, that's just for me personally. I don't love that. I think it's kind of cheap. Um, I, I think, you know, look, if your agent CCs you on the offer and you just even respond to that email, that's going to put you ahead of 80% of the other lenders. Um, the agent should have good rapport with the listing agent. That's look, I'm more inclined to give somebody information that they might find useful to get their offer accepted. If I like the agent and I feel confident in their ability to get to the finish line. Uh, I mean, you see you, people stand out in funny ways. Sometimes the verbiage in someone's email is enough for me to be like, Oh, this person's funny. Like I like their attitude, you know, and that gives me a little bit more confidence in just wanting to even talk to that person. Um, you know, you see funny things offering your children, you know, in the body of an email to get the deal done, or, you know, can I send you a pizza, something like that? Not that you're actually going to do any of these things, but just being funny, standing out, you're getting 30 offers and a lot of them are just coming across with no communication whatsoever. Here's the offer bullet points. My client's so qualified. They love the house, blah, blah, blah. Everybody says the same thing. So say something different. You know, I'm not saying that that's going to get your offer accepted, 
but your goal is to stand out because at this point that's you know you're having it's a sea of sameness man that's really 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 good information okay so in the sea of sameness stand out now you said you know hey uh, say something funny or offer to send them a pizza not a bad idea the pizzas i like that um you know send the pizza and you know counter offer what was that ricky was that- uh, I saw in a, one of the real estate groups post, somebody put that in a counter offer. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I like that too. Um, what, what is it, what is another way to, um, to do that, to maybe stand out, say something, should it, you know, would you mention something, um, in that offer? Like, Hey, it was great to meet you. Uh, you know, when we saw the property on this day, or, uh, it's so cool that the sellers are Packers fans or, you know, like, is it, would it be something like that too? Or is it, does it need to be humor? Cause I'm just trying to figure out, I think it's a good idea to say, let's do something different. Let's not look like the same email that's coming in over and over. Um, and somehow related in, I think a lot of people will have trouble being funny, you know, but maybe something like that, something that correlates. You bring up a good point. Another thing that stands out is when somebody makes an effort to show that they were in the property. So part of the problem with this market is that buyers are getting smoked. And so you start to, they get fatigued and you start to see these people write offers on property they've never seen, um, which we never want to take on our listings. So uh, mentioning something specific about the property that you would only know if you had been there is very useful. I actually, because I'm psychotic, go through, when I get offers, I go through the central lock logs and the showing time logs to make sure that that person was there. Wow. So you go straight up detective on that stuff. That's interesting because just recently, um, in fact, this was yesterday. What is today? Today's Wednesday. Yeah. Today's Wednesday. So this was yesterday. So we had a buyer who, who canceled. They were just seeing the property for the first time at the inspection. And, um, you know, that was, and then they were like, yeah, we don't, you know, it's not for us. I thought to myself, huh, that's interesting. I wonder how they got their offer accepted. Um, not having seen the property, I'm sure the listing agent would, if they had known that, put it in consideration. So it's interesting that you're bringing that up. And I didn't know that they hadn't seen the property. I had no idea. It was just, it's just kind of a crazy situation, I guess, the way that it all, it all happened. Um, but so, so making remarks to show that you've been in the property, maybe notating something, Hey, the third bedroom is going to be perfect for our daughter or something like that. You know, that would go a long way. You think? Yeah, or say something like, you know, my clients don't even hate the pink ceiling in the bathroom. You know, just something that's like, okay, these people are definitely there. Um, You know, back to the VA side of things, and this is more, I I hope that there are some listing agents listening to this. Um, You know, one of, if you know anything about financing, one of the biggest advantages to accepting a VA offer is how easy it is to qualify. And I'm sure you could speak more on that, but um, you know, conventional financing that everyone loves so much is a really big bucket and it encompasses, you know, 5% down to 30% down and more and, you know, high balance, uh, jumbo, which get increasingly more difficult to qualify for with increasingly more difficult overlays from the lenders, um, for, you know, various requirements for reserves and things like that. A VA buyer is qualified. There's no loan limits. Um, it's very easy to qualify for. The credit score qualifications are a lot lower. So, like, I guess my point is that when you see a VA approval, you can be pretty confident that that buyer is actually approved. Whereas, like, when you see a conventional approval, it's anybody's guess. I mean, lenders are not. In my experience, in all these years, I've never called a lender and had them not say the client was super qualified and so great. You know, you never call a lender and have them go, ah, this one's kind of iffy. They're right up to their debt to income ratio. So if we jump a quarter point or an eighth of a point in the market, they're out for sure. So the, that same old song and dance that you get from every lender is not super useful. So yeah, there's a lot to be said for being able to extrapolate how qualified a client is by the product that they're using. And I think that VA is a really simple product to do that with because it's simple to qualify for. Um, it has very uniform guidelines and, and it's easy. Well, I will definitely concur on that and, uh, agree a thousand percent. There's a lot more landmines and other products 
than there are with VA. And it is the loosest, you know, um, mortgage option as far as qualifications are concerned. For example, with us, a uh, minimum 600 credit score, you know, um, that's not a good credit score, but you can get a VA home loan. And, um, you know, also residual calculation, no DTI overlay. So, I mean, we've, I've done VA loans, 74% DTI. Um, and usually those are extenuating circumstances or some income we're not able to use or whatever it may be, but you can still do it if it meets residual. So, you know, the, the VA loan is a lot less likely to go sideways um, in a transaction than some of the other loans are because there's a lot more landmines, a lot more guidelines that change um, on a regular basis with the other loan types. Um, so it is a much more solid. And that's what I typically try to lean on, Rick. I'll kind of tell you what my my pitch is that, hey, this is a loan program that hasn't changed in 60 years. We don't have any overlays except for the minimum credit score. Here's the credit score of the client. Here's the DTI. Um, here's how you know um, qualified they are, basically just in bullet points. And I try to keep it as simple as that you know, in the email and let them know that I focus on VA. Um, because I, I think that helps too. Is I mean, would you say that that's a benefit too to get a VA buyer when and knowing that the lender focuses on VA? Yeah, I mean, it, it helps to know that the lender is familiar with the product. Um, you know, honestly, I think that there are a lot of agents that just aren't that intimately aware of the way the various products work. Um, I had a conversation with an agent who received a, a VA offer on a very expensive property and and they really liked the agent and they really liked the buyer um, and everything about it. But she was really leaning toward a conventional um, offer because she she was like, I don't think that you can even get a VA loan for this much money. And I was like, there's no VA loan limits. And like, let me tell you how much more difficult it is to qualify for jumbo financing in this market. Um, you know, their jumbo is a nightmare. So I would take a high balance VA deal over a jumbo any day of the week. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a big difference there. And I'll also say like a lot of people in this market, I know, at least I don't want to say I know my guess is that Ricky doesn't sell in Riverside County. Am I right about that? <laughs> so Riverside, you know, what? it's not my favorite thing, but right now, there's not very many homes on the market. So if I got to drive an hour and 20 minutes to do a deal, that's fine too. <laughs> well, here's what's interesting about Riverside. No high balance limit. So conforming, you know, you're, for like FHA, you're stuck at 477000 um, For um, conventional, it's, uh, oh my gosh, I'm going to forget now. It's 548000 I think, or something like that. And then there's just no high balance. So you, you have, it, once you're above that is jumbo territory. How crazy is that? So in, in Riverside County, especially the VA offer is going to be really, 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 really strong because you don't have any of those limitations. And I don't know why they did that, but I was told um, that Riverside, the county decided that I think they're trying to keep prices low there or something. I'm not really sure, but no high balance limit, not for government or uh, conventional. Isn't that interesting. That's super interesting. What I would be curious, what would be the government's incentive to keep property values low, considering that property tax is based on purchase price and is a revenue generating stream for the county? Dude, I have no idea. The only thing I can think of is that they must want to try to keep, there must be pressure from the locals to keep real estate values lower and affordable. It's the only thing I can think of, because that is something that they had to you know, you don't opt in for high balance. You'd have to like opt out. I don't know what process they went through to do that, but they must have gone through some process at some point to say, nope, we don't want the high balance, you know, loans to be available in this county. Um, and it really does squeeze it quite a bit. But for the VA buyer who, you know, has full entitlement and doesn't have a loan limit, you know, it's no big deal. It's just six, one, half dozen, the others are making difference, um, which down here in San Diego, we don't have nearly that issue. Um, with the other loan types, but it's just interesting how, how that works and, and how that uh, settles up. So Ricky, I've, I've taken a lot of your time here. I want to see if there's anything you can give me. Is there any golden nuggets that I didn't extract from you here on this interview with regard to how buyers can win in this market or why um, listing agents should consider VA offers more, more closely? Um, you know, I, I also, 
in in addition to the other things that you're telling people, I think in your in the body of your email, it would be beneficial because people aren't so intimately aware of how all these different products work to just mention like in a one sentence thing that VA is the easiest product to qualify for. Okay. Because I don't think agents really understand that. Um, and I think that if that was a part of your canned, you know, response to an offer submission, that we could sort of educate people a little bit more about why VA offers shouldn't necessarily be discriminated against. Um, there are a lot of upside. There are more upsides to accepting a VA offer that VA offer than there are downsides. Um, I'm very comfortable taking VA on my listings. Uh, I always have been. I do a lot of things other agents don't necessarily do that that you're almost taught when you come into this business there are certain things that you should avoid accepting you know VA offers um, accepting contingent offers I like both of those things nice well that's interesting on the contingent offer side we'll have to do another video about that one so here's my last couple questions for you um, EMD does it matter and then number two will be pre-approval letters. A lot of agents want the pre-approval letter to be just for the amount that they're writing the offer for. Um, is that the right way to go about it? Or is it better to show that someone is approved for, for a lot more um, and, and well-qualified? I wish she was not watching this. I guess. <laughs> I that it's super interesting that people avoid, first of all, it's really difficult to just get nonstop, um, pre-approval letters for every price point that you want when people are this busy. I think that it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, you're almost out of having to uh, negotiate with buyer's agents at this point because they're putting their best foot forward. And so I'm very rarely seeing a pre-approval letter and going, oh, this person can come up another 20,000. Let's counter them for that because you're already getting these absurd offers that are far over where you would expect them to be. Um, I don't think earnest money really matters at all. I Can you even think of a situation that you've been in where a buyer has lost their earnest money? It's never happened on why my, my watch, my friend. So never uh, happened. Of any of my transactions, whether it was the the buyer, where I, whether I was on the buy side or the sell side, um, so I don't think that that's really as sweet of a carrot. Okay. Okay, that's good. That's I mean, good to know. I see people do it. They they'll counter you for for three percent on the EMD, and it's like okay, like we can do that because it doesn't matter. But like, what about that makes you feel better? I don't know, but I that's love, the thing. It makes people feel better. So, like, should you know, it's, I do, it doesn't make any sense, but it doesn't make anybody more likely to default on their contract or less likely to default on their contract. It's really difficult to keep a buyer's earnest money, first of all. Yeah. Yeah. So, percent, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't care about the earnest money personally. I will never tell a seller. Look, this offer is really good, but this one's got a lot of earnest money. <laughs> I just don't. You know, maybe I would actually really like for you to have somebody else on who loves big earnest money, and then I'd like to know why. <laughs> so well, I don't know if for liking VA offers, maybe you could put some feelers out there for agents who love big, extravagant earnest money deposits, and then we could talk about why. <laughs> a perfect way to end the interview ricky silver thank you so much for your time today brother i really really appreciate you coming on and help spread the word uh the good word in real estate which is that va offers are good offers and should be highly considered for our va buyers thank you so much for your time brother i really appreciate you jumping on here today ricky silver ladies and gentlemen <laughs> all right so obviously you can contact ricky at silver homes dot com and uh you know i wanted to have ricky on today because i thought that it would make sense to have someone who has a lot of experience um with you know listings with va offers accepting va offers not afraid of them to say hey listen look 
I'm a straightforward guy. I know how this stuff works. I've studied it. I understand it. I know what's good about it. I know what's not good about it. And I have all of these pieces in front of me so I can educate my sellers on what's best. But again, notice what he said. He said the appraisal bridge is really where the consideration is taking place. So whether it's this offer or that offer, it doesn't really matter. If we think that the appraisal probably won't hit because we've got offers that are way above asking and maybe way above comps, then the appraisal bridge is what's going to be the difference maker. So that was a really important and key takeaway there for all the buyers out there. This is how you win. This is how you win in this market. If you want to win, that's how it's done. Share this with your friends. Let's help make them smarter than everyone else. See you guys soon.